uh, studies are actually conducted by my students. My students, when they come to NUS, uh, urbanized uh, students can be quite swaku, but uh, after doing a research project, uh, it's quite amazing what they're able to find out. Uh, right? uh, and uh, when I started, um, there was an author researcher who talked to Peter Ng, the crab expert, and he said, uh, we don't know what authors are doing actually. If you find a foolish student, then uh, get them to uh, join in. So I joined in. Uh, but what I realized is there were many, many species. Uh, there were like 80 names of authors, but actually it's just four species, right? And uh, in Asia. And of the four, uh, two had been reported from Singapore, but um, Bern uh, Bernard Harrison's father, John Harrison, mentioned authors in 66, but then after that, we don't really have records. So they're missing like 70s, 80s. Um, and a good reason too, la, there was a lot of uh, urbanization. So if you're an author trying to hang out in the coast, it's quite a depressing period because there's reclamation. Uh, reservoirs were being built, right? So rivers were being canalized. Um, <clears throat> but fast forward to happier times, right? Uh, the reclamation activity is considerable, but it has calmed down. Uh, there's a network of parks and park connectors. Uh, the reservoirs, although they are all not natural, right? They're all canals and uh, vertical wall bodies of water. They are clean, right? Uh, and they're full of fish. So this is uh, Kalang River from the 60s. I was in St. Andrew School and the nearby Potong Pasir residents called the Kalang River um, the dead chicken river. Yeah. So uh, it was black and stinky and nothing lived, right? Uh, occasionally, if you're lucky and there's heavy storms, then there were big carcasses floating down. Uh, now this, this is my school uh, and it's clean and otters swim in it. Uh, but canalized rivers were important for flood control. Uh, and um, only recently was a canal naturalized. So modern engineers say, okay, we can naturalize the canal. It still will allow us to manage flood. So Bishan Amokyo is like a dream, you know. It's the only park, I think, uh, and parks gets unsolicited compliments about this park, right? Um, and there's a guy living uh, next to the park and he's taking videos of otters hunting fish uh, every other day. Um, but what were in the canals is a lot of exotic fish. Uh, so these are photos of fishermen from the internet and they're catching lots of big fish. So we had a dinner table that was getting stacked with food, uh, just waiting for a large predator to turn up and it was an otter, right? It actually turned up in uh, 1998. So uh, this is Singapore and next door is Malaysia, right? It's our source of many things that disappeared, right? So uh, two different countries, but it's just a river. So they turned out in Sungai Bulo. We predicted that, we expected that they would turn out in Sungai Bulo in 1994. And four years later, they were resident. So uh, they were there with pups, right? And uh, we saw them around woodlands. And then there were reports on Tekong and Ubin. This includes small claw otters as well. Uh, and then eventually we started seeing them in Changi, uh, Lorong Halus, Pulau Serangoon. Uh, all this is due to records submitted by members of public. Uh, and so these kind of photos were like, wow, so uh, precious, right? Because remember, I've been working in the early 90s in Malaysia and Indonesia, and I would walk at night upwind without a torch because the otters were so shy, right? But here they're turning up, they were visible. Uh, we were very happy when they had juveniles, right? Uh, then this is golf courses, they started uh, appearing. Uh, and as they spread, eventually they reach Bishan Park. Now. Of course, the, the, during this time, many people in the submit records, they ask us, hey, there are seals. I saw seals in Singapore. Oh, I saw beavers. This, this especially in the early days, uh, later on, people begin to realize, oh, these are authors. And uh, Ma, um, the Minister of uh, National Development, Kobun Wan, he was so excited because um, the authors turned up in um, Gardens by the Bay. Right? So all the Gardens by the Bay staff were exchanging on their WhatsApp. I seen author here, I seen author there. I went down to investigate with Adrian Lu, who's now at M Park. And we hunted, hunted, and then we figured out, okay, I think we know there's an author in the gardens. And then uh, this was after about four hours of work. And then lo and behold, the author walked out of the reservoir, walked across my feet. So, you know, 
I'm the guy who's been stalking otters from a distance. This otter walked up, it looked at me briefly, and then he carried on walking. We were like, oh, this is madness. And then it went to the children's garden, and then it stood on its hind legs, and it vocalized. So we said, no, not one otter, there must be two. But we hadn't seen the female, right? That means the female is expecting. And then later on that evening, uh, gardens visitors sent uh, Gardens by the Bay video footage. The mum was there, right? And then eventually they had birth to cubs. Uh, and then, you know, <coughs> Corbin Wan wanted to announce it and, and we had to figure out, okay, what message should he give? Uh, uh, besides saying otters are here, and we came up with watch from a distance, right? Enjoy the view of authors from a distance. Uh, and then when it turned out at Bishan Park, Bishan Park just adopted it, right? So that was good because um, nature deficit Singaporeans turned out they were had quite, uh, they're quite sensible with authors. Uh, mostly they kept a the distance. Sometimes some people went down to approach and then other people say, oh, don't go so close. So that was good, right? Um, and of course, it made for wonderful photos like, against the landscape. And then, you know, there were Facebook groups with tens of thousands of visitors and, you know, people around the world were following it. Uh, I, I, I've, I had a lot of pain in my heart for my fellow author researchers who were still trudging through the night trying to find an author and we were getting photos like this. So um, when they visit, it's like therapy. They sit down and they watch the authors close. The author watchers in Singapore have taken so many global visitors out, researchers, uh, and it's like therapy for their soul. Can you imagine we have an Australian, uh, one of our Australian senior scientists has been working authors 30 years, hasn't seen them in the wild in Europe. So they appeared in many places. This is Meryl's uh, uh, slides from her thesis. And you can see they started occupying every like possible space. And then February 2014, also oh, important, appear at Marina Bay. And then after that, went into uh, Bishan Amokyo. So SG50, uh, Australia gave us 50 barbecues, one of which was at Bishan. Uh, our Prime Minister was with Abbott, the Australian PM. And then the authors turned up and played and they watched, uh, they came down and they took photos and we have you on video. A wonderful ambassador, right? Then of course, people ask, how many authors are? Huh? Then uh, we asked for a lot of records. So this was Merrill's project. Uh, uh, Merrill's project started asking people for records. And then eventually Max did a phenomenal job of hunting down right, every family, right? Uh, make sure we weren't double counting, uh, photo, video verification, all that. And then we came up with a number. Lah. So roughly we think uh, 10 plus families, uh, maybe around 90 individuals. Uh, it's a, it seems to be about maxed out already the space. Lah. They don't seem to like reservoirs, maybe hard to catch fish. Uh, they really like the, the rivers, the coast, right? And then we put out this graphic so that people realize we actually do have uh, Asian small claw otter in Pulau Ubin. So MPAX is very concerned about that. They require the smaller streams in mangrove to catch small fish and prawns and all that and fit the crab. So mangrove restoration work at Pulau Ubin is a very, very important project because the small claw otter clings on precariously to that corner of the island. And this is a reflection of Asia. As Asian cities clean up rivers, the smooth kota otter will return. It can handle the big rivers and the big fish in those rivers. So they have a survival in the future by coexisting with men in cleaned up urban environments. But the small claw otter still needs the natural habitat. So in Malaysia, they are confident about your small claw otter. In fact, it turned up in Klang River near KL. But uh, small claw otter, we think habitat is uh, declining. So uh, that's the situation. It's a reflection of the situation in Asia. So this is Singapore, you know, in a nutshell. It's like a petri dish. It's like a lab for the rest of Asia. So we are quite, um, uh, we are quite aware of this responsibility. The things we find out, we try and make sure we share. La. So when students do the projects and then we write out the papers, that's uh, Singapore's contribution to helping out uh, auto conservation in Asia. Right now, one of the problems is danger in crossing roads. So, this was a video taken by a PUV guy, uh, coastal road, right? And uh, there's a lot of heavy vehicles steaming down those roads. So, as otters move between one patch of habitat to another, uh, they got to navigate and they're not always lucky. La. So, you know, then you get roadkill. We try to recover the carcasses. Nowadays, uh, we'll send it to Chiada, the pathologist at Singapore Zoo. Uh, to do autopsy. Uh, if it's not just a straightforward roadkill, we want to know what's happening. Uh. So recovering of the carcass and all that, the whole 
uh, auto working group community uh, sees to uh, sees to it. Uh, so, uh, what have the students' projects uh, revealed, right? right? So, one of the things is, um, otters during my time were nocturnal animals, right? But here, they are diurnals. That means they are active in the day. So, typically, they have two peak activities. Lah. So, if you ask an otter watcher, undergone sea otters, when to find, they will tell you early morning or uh, late afternoon, right? This is typical for many diurnal animals. Uh, uh, Nobody is so crazy to go out in the midday sun. So they make sure they get their food beginning of the day and then they have a supplemental meal towards the end of the day. If you see an animal hunting like middle of the day, then <clears throat> it didn't get enough food during the morning hunt. Right? So active two to three times a day, dawn to dusk, and of course they engage in a variety of activity. Um, uh, this kind of scene was fascinating for people around the world because they've come from... Uh, <clears throat> a little crevice near a substation and then they come out to the side canal that will lead to the Singapore River uh, and they have to make this big leap, right? So uh, there was a bunch of people leaning on the railing with me and watching them as they made their way out to go for breakfast, right? Uh, and this is at Bishan Amokyo. So HDB Heartland, they can see otters moving in formation uh, and how they are uh, making contact calls uh, as they hunt. This was at McRitchie, and this was handphone video, you know, so they were next to me, uh, ignoring me, and they were hunting, and of course, uh, hammering the uh, park's vegetation, but you know, it's at park, so it's okay. So, uh, <clears throat> we've studied some of this, uh, we've shared it in lectures, and in papers, uh, and video footage, but the first people to share were actually otter watchers on the ground uh, taking a lot of videos. So if you look up Fast Nail on YouTube, right, uh, he's actually labeled a video like what's going on. Is it, is it sprinting? Is it hunting and all that? So there's wonderful video tutorials for people around the world. When I started looking for otters, I went to Zoo Nagara, which had smooth coated otters, and I went to the enclosure every day for four days in order to be clear in my mind what the smooth otter looked like. Right, uh, Singapore Zoo had small claw otter, so I went to look for smooth coat otter. Now the amount of video material is phenomenal, right? Um, okay, interesting thing. We got all these fish in the canals, right? Should you eat fish head first, body first, or tail first? So we will go for the body, right? That's where all the soft flesh is. But uh, these otters are going head first, right? And when they slice through the head, my goodness, it's effortless. So this is an uh, otter eating the head, right? So I realized, oh, we got to look at it from their perspective. They have carnations. It's a phenomenal uh, scissor cutting teeth. And so the head of a fish is not an issue. We also think it might be easier for handling. So you have a strong grasp on the fish, bite off the head, and it's no longer struggling. But when it comes to catfish, wow, that one is a different kettle of fish, uh, right? So catfish, they eat the tail first. Because I don't know if you've seen a, a, a fisherman trying to beat a catfish into submission. That's a pretty tough skull. Right? Um, oh, and then we see begging behavior. So adults at some stage of their life must become, uh, yes, unimpressed by the whining of their young. It's time for you to go up and uh, go look for food. Right? Um, Okay, sorry. It, do they need dry land? Yes, they need to dry off. In fact, um, uh, Nicole Duplay, when she was uh, uh, just finished her field work, she studied zoos around the world. She realized some zoos didn't even give otters dry land. They couldn't dry up and they would suffer from hypothermia and die in shock and all that kind of stuff. So it's very important that they dry their fur, right? Uh, because as it gets waterlogged, then it's no longer insulating. Now, in an urban environment, they are adaptable. They make use of soil beneath uh, urban structures. Oh, and they love that MPAX has so many mulching at the base of trees. Now, this is sprinting. They're going to toilet. It's mainly fish particles that come out. Uh, but they also have this wonderful smell. It's pheromones. And these uh, serve as advertisement. So, you know, when I was sorting through fish scales, uh, from Penang and trying to figure out what on earth was going on. 
uh, Indian postgrad walked past and he identified parts and then I realized he was a fish biologist. They have to boil a fish down and reassemble it by uh, sticking all the bones together. So he was an expert. So really this work should be done by fish biologists. Uh, so Meryl, who looked through Spain's uh, sprains, uh, we took our hat off to her because she could identify fish from parts with the help of our fish experts in the museum, right? So they eat all these fish, right? Uh, in mangroves, they eat quite a bit of prawns too, right? Uh, and then after they finish feeding, they go back to a hope. Now, it's quite funny because in the past, when we studied them in the wild, we'll have all kinds of measurements about substrate for the hope and all that. Uh, in the urban environment, they just want to squeeze a place to squeeze in so that a predator or competitor that's attacking them will find it very difficult to approach them. And, you know, they upturned everything about how big should a family be, first litter, second litter, third litter, fourth, fifth. My God, the numbers increase. We've got up to 19. Um, so why are they so large? Uh, maybe there's a lot of food. Maybe it's hard to find new territory, so they, they might be staying together. Um, and how far do they travel? So, you know, uh, they were in Gardens by the Bay, right? Uh, same families have gone all the way up Kalang River to Bishan Amukyo, go to the reservoir, right? Uh, and they've actually looped around and come back down Singapore River. So uh, that's quite, this whole area, you think, oh, how many otters could we have? Could we have 100 otters here? Right now, we think the most four families, right? So there's not a lot of space because you need to hunt, then fish get scared, then you got to shift your location, right? Uh, so a common question is, uh, will otters, will there be so many otters that they'll come and uh, snatch our children? And uh, the tragedy of that is actually there's a concept called carrying capacity. Everything is limited by space, right? So even Singapore, right? We don't build enough flats, then uh, we're not going to have new families. So they will fight, right? And when they fight, then uh, pups get killed. Uh, they get killed by roadkill. So about we lose about 10% of the population now. Thankfully for otters, they are so charming. I mean, I'm so jealous because uh, I'm involved in long-tail macaque work and long-tail macaques, like, everyone's like, oh, bad monkey, but otter is good otter. So uh, they have a disproportionately high charm potential, uh, but we've had to explain. So this Tian Chao from M Parks, every time there's an area where otters are interfacing in public, they don't you go out and put up signs. Uh, very basic explanations watch from a distance essentially is it right and people follow uh, otter watch and otter city uh, we also took a deliberate intent to educate our leadership lah. so we joined with pa right uh, their project blue wave uh, we put a young person like max to go and talk to our minister explain concepts like carrying capacity so it's been encouraging lah, right and pa while well, when we partner them then they went nuts man there's a guy who walks around in an otter suit it's like you know scientists is going to do that. We won't even think of it. So we have to have partners from a diverse group, right? So this is Otter Working Group. You can see Ambu on the far right. Uh, she's on Acres. Um, on the left was Merrill, and then there was Tian Chao for M Parks, uh, even uh, from M Parks, and there are people from PUB. And of course, the minister wants to know what's going on. So I'm going to stop here. I've given you enough uh, food for thought, right? So okay, ask me questions now. All right. Thank you for that, Siva. That was very entertaining. Of course, with all of the outer pictures. So, um, I don't know whether you saw the chat, but it's like exploding. We've got a bunch of questions. Oh, that's good. Right. Um, so, uh, if anyone, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to highlight them or do you just want to read the questions to you? Um, why do authors not shit in the water? And why do they do in the passageway or footpath? So you, you can help highlight for me, uh, Kanan. So okay. why do they not defecate in the water? Well, uh, defecation serves that uh, function of advertisement. So a lone otter that turns up, smells the area. Hey, there, there's a female chick here. Let me, sorry, not chick, uh, otter. Uh, let me go and check her out. Or if another male comes, it's a holy cow, there's a territorial male here and then I, I want to be cautious. So there's an advertisement purpose. And so if it's an advertisement, you don't uh, bury it somewhere in the woods, right? You do it in a prominent place. Okay, fair enough. Um, Why don't I we see small claw otters in there? Uh, they can't handle our big canals. Huh? So they really need small mangrove streams. Oh, I see. Then there's uh, Marcus counting me down privately. <laughs> 
Uh, Ingsin has asked, uh, in addition to the question above about the small cloth otters inland, uh, could uh, inland populations of freshwater crabs support populations of uh, small cloth otters? So our freshwater streams, right, in our central catchment are very precious. That's why when people talk about digging inside the central catchment, we go nuts. Huh? Uh, and there's very few streams and there are not many crabs. If you're out in one of those streams doing a crab survey, um, the common crab he talks about, it seems to be a lot, but that lot is not enough to support uh, any otter population. Okay. Uh, Gwyn wants to know if, uh, if there's any evidence that small cloud otters might get pushed around by the smooth coat otters. Um, since their diet is uh, quite different, you know, small fiddler crab, small fish, uh, and then the, the smooth coat otter, larger, right, fish, uh, they, they seem to be able to coexist. So along Malaysian coast, there is coexistence of smooth coated and small cloth. But there may be some spatial uh, separation. So sometimes we don't know whether the small cloth otter is coming out at night, uh, if the smooth coat otter is there in the day. Uh, there haven't been really a lot of studies about that. Um, but I would expect a bigger otter to pick all the best hope sites. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, let's see, the next question. Uh, Chingyi wants to know if both these uh, otter species can coexist. Coexist. Uh? Uh, yeah, so I can't answer that, right? They, they do coexist because your, your wetland environment is uh, quite complex. It's not uniform. So for example, Malaysia, right? There's paddy fields. Then there's mangroves, right? Uh, uh, rocky shore. Uh, so different, uh, the different species do better in slightly different situations. So you could find them within the same large area, but there are habitat variations that would support uh, both species. So um, when, when I was working in Malaysia or Indonesia, they would occur uh, together. You'd find both of them together. Okay. Um, next we have, uh, Steve wants to know if uh, solo otters appearing in our rivers are expelled from a family or is this their natural progression of them heading out and expanding the territories? So um, um, the otters, like any mammals, when uh, they achieve, when the males achieve sexual maturity, they will they will wander off, right? Uh, with that rising testosterone. So actually, what's curious is we don't see as many uh, uh, sub adults wandering off as we would expect. A lot of them stay in the family. So. Um, there's more research on birds about this, la, like cooperative breeding, you know. That means the, mm -hmm. the first litter will stay with the parent and then help in the rearing of the second litter. So your, your elder brother, elder sister. La. But okay. the, the primary care when the mother feeds the fish to the young is normally done by the parent. Um, so what uh, some of my students research, Tina um, and Anusha, uh, we realized that, and from the author watchers, right, the territory shrinks when they're raising uh, pups. So when the territory shrinks, they all hang around the pups, you know. So uh, if you're a carnivore going and hunting fish, the fish will now be terrified and they start moving about. So your effort to get the fish is going to keep increasing. But yet they stay with the pups for weeks. So actually they are providing protection from the pups at the expense of their dinner. Right, so that's why you know when the pups oh can swim already, then the adults are always like, come on, come on, follow me, and then the pups oh, I cannot swim anymore and all that. Uh, it was very very easy to realize this at Singapore River because um, we had a hole, and then you had a long river, and you could see how far the pup would follow the adult before they swim, 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 and then turn back. And then you know there are bridges along Singapore River, so you could see gradually they managed to make it to Marina Bay, and then they can go and hunt in fresh areas where the fish are not as molested so regularly. So this is um, uh, foraging patches. So every carnivore and every territorial animal uh, will have to establish a large home range and then sample the, the food from different parts. Right? They can't eat, keep eating in one part and they run out of food. So they have to move between patches. And so then they become territorial and then if they see someone else turn up, then like get out of my place. So we see that happening with community cats. Uh, some of them are quite territorial, so new guy comes and they go and beat them up. And why? Because they protect uh, feeding ground. Okay. Um, 
Oh, someone's asking about the Little India sighting. So this uh, otters in Little India, right? Uh, were there any other otters sighted around, um, like in, in urban areas during this circuit breaker period? And uh, were there any other animals that you know of? Oh, okay. So the, 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 the Little India otters is uh, like a tragic family, you know, it's like um, they reared, they couldn't find a place to rear their pups. So they finally went to Botanic Garden. So last year, October, the otter watcher said, hey, hey uh, female is pregnant. She's turning up. Uh, these otter watchers are incredible. Uh, I don't know. It's like you go to the toilet and they're watching you. So the moment the female was sluggish, they, one of them is a mom. So she said, I, I can recognize a pregnant woman. I used to waddle like that. So uh, they alerted us and said, uh, Sungai Bulo, uh, sorry, Singapore Botanic Garden, the mum is raising, rearing young. So we're like, oh, so excited. And then uh, eventually, when the young were born, they moved around Botanic Gardens, right? But then uh, Botanic Gardens is a nursery site. So it's like Bishan Amonkyo Park. You want to raise your pups, okay, it's great as a nursery site, but when you're going to eat real solid food, uh, that place exhausted already, you're going to move. So Bishan Amokyo, what happens? They'll move down Kalang River towards Marina Bay. Uh, Singapore Botanic Gardens, they can move down river and go to uh, Singapore River near uh, the old Zook, right? Or Jack Kim, right? Zion Road. Uh, but these guys went down there, oh, 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 occupied. So fight, 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 and then they backed off. So they, they've kept appearing around the central watershed, uh, Kandang Kerbal Hospital. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's not Kandang Kerbal Hospital, uh. Is Kandang Kerbau Women's and Children Hospital now, right? Um, and then they turned out in Tan Tok Seng, and they turned out in Little India. Uh, then they turned out in Istana, you know. So uh, my friends at Istana said, like, oh no, are they going to eat all the fish in Swan Lake? I said, your Swan Lake is too small. If it was a big, 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 big pond, a lake, then maybe they could stay there, but cannot. Huh? So they are, they, are nomad, they are nomads. They are lost. They are wandering, right? Uh, looking for a place to stay where it's not occupied and they are in a very difficult situation. So what we are seeing is the validation of the carrying capacity. Central watershed, you've got Singapore River, Kalang River, Marina Bay. Okay, where's the fourth family going to live? Okay, they anchor themselves at Botanic Gardens and then come out and then look for a possible place. So they came out, they found a condo. Wow, got koi. Uh. Then one time they whacked the koi, right? There's no more food for tomorrow, you know. Uh, koi are uh, unfair, are uh, really in an unfair situation because a koi pond, right, or a koi <laughs> water feature is trying to make the koi obvious. What does that mean? The koi got no place to hide. If koi go and hide, then the owner after spending $70,000 is like, where's my koi? I can't see my koi. So the koi is always in your face. So you show a koi in the otter's face, then they're like, eat lah. But because they're so easy to catch, it actually does the otter a disservice because it eaten all of it. Then what's for breakfast tomorrow? It's gone. So that's why they never stay at these places, they leave. Anyway, I must say uh, that condo fixed all the gaps very, very fast. They're very responsive. And perhaps when I talk to them, they're quite smart people. Uh, so they did a good job. But the authors will wonder, keep on wondering. Uh. Oh, the COVID effect uh, is that now when they wander in an urban space, uh, less traffic, less people, so they can hang around and sit in the urban Little India when they sit down there. If you're familiar with Little India and used to the crowds that are there, then that's a uh, mind-blowing, like, what on earth is happening? So we should uh, pay respect to the crowds that are normally in Little India, which were not there, and so the author could just relax. Fair enough. Um, and we got a couple of, I think we'll do one last question, because this one last question has been asked a few times. The hybridization of the two otter species. So there was a study done a while ago, right? And then um, it was found that the population here were hybrids. So are there any further studies done? Or is this something that's still ongoing? Like, do you think hybridization will occur in the future if we get more small plots in? Okay, normally they coexist and they don't hybridize. So, uh, was there an unnatural situation where they're living together? Uh, can it happen? It's happened in uh, Indonesian zoos before. Uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, this is maternal DNA la, sitting within the smooth quarter otter. So, uh, I think that we are contending with extreme habitat loss in Asia. Uh, so that's a bigger problem to solve. Uh, okay. Are there geneticists working on the hybridization issue? Yes, there is. Uh, but there are a lot of issues uh, because now genetic material you want to send across, uh, people are all possessive. Like the Malaysians will be, why do I want to share it? You I want to do the study myself. 
then the Italian is sitting in the lab and I'm not going to let you do it because uh, I think your lab isn't as good as mine. So I want reliable records. So, and then there's a Japanese scientist working in Malaysia who said, we got to do something because your Singapore author is going to pollute the Malaysian population. I said, we didn't have Singapore uh, authors. These are all Malaysian authors. So what you need to do is do a genetic test of the authors all over and some nature figure it out. But uh, realistically, uh, hybridized or not, if we can still see them around 30 years time in the rest of Southeast Asia, it's due to the incredible effort that conservationists around the world are doing. So I'm not so concerned about the hybridization uh, uh, issue. Okay. Right. Uh, Marcus, you got any questions? Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up the Q&A. So there was one last question um, in the Q&A, which I, I'm so interested. So regarding the Little India authors that, that was um, on the papers, right? Um, there was a question which asked, uh, which of the four families was, was this? And you said there were four families and this is a tragic story. So which, which of these four families were it's they? It's not a tragic story. La. I'm sorry I said that. La. It's just uh, that, that one is being anthropomorphic, like, you know, the, the wandering Lonely Hearts Club or something. This is just a normal story. This happens all the time. It happens with kingfishers. It happens with long tail macaque. It happens with civets, right? It happens with parrots. It's just that we don't see it. Here, it gets played out in front of our eyes. There are people that explain what's going on. And so, yeah. So, uh, sorry, Marcus, what was the question? Uh, so the question was, uh, which of this four, the, the Bishan and the Marina are the very famous ones. Uh, were this part of this family? Or were they a oh, okay. So the nomenclature is very confusing. La. It's from where the first litter was born. So now the, the group that you see wandering around is the Zook otter. So that means the first litter was born at Singapore River. But of course, you know, I told you they went to Singapore Botanic Gardens to raise their second litter. And then when they wandered out the Singapore River, it was occupied by the Singapore Botanic Gardens family which now raise a litter at, at Zook. So when Anusha did a thesis, I say, for goodness sake, call them family one, family two, family three, family four, right? Uh, what is the family at Bishan, Amokyo? So the author watchers say, oh, that's Marina family. So Bishan is somewhere in Marina Bay uh, and they came up Singapore River to fight with the Botanic Gardens authors who had previously fended off the Zook family. Oh, okay. This one's like so opera, like, you know, Korean drama. Or something. <laughs> uh, you you got to follow it every weekend. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's the only reason we are sure is because auto watchers follow very often. Uh, right? So now, during, uh, so now they are being tested because they cannot walk around, right? Right? Now, now, now they cannot walk around. So when reports come in, they are using their uh, up to circuit breaker. Where were the authors? What was the family composition? So where should they be? Right? Uh, then when people say, oh, like one author was limping. So you know, Zook got one that's limping. Uh, it's requiring all the, uh, um, all the powers of the force to keep track of records that are coming in. So every day they talk about this, you know. Uh, so because of that, we are able to track the families because most of the smooth quarter authors look alike. It's a brown furry thing. Uh. So, I mean, look, look behind me. This is Mei Huang's photo. 18 of the Bishan family sleeping, how are you going to differentiate them? So it's on the daily tracking, the family composition um, that we are able to follow who went where and did what. That's so awesome. Yeah, working on leopard cats, you can tell, that's hard to tell them apart, but for authors, it's, I can imagine it's much, much harder, much more challenging. So, um, so we've come to the end of the talk for Siva. I'm going to unmute everyone and maybe we could all thank him for giving such an engaging and uh, insightful talk for authors in Singapore. So I knew it all. But don't leave yet thank because you. we are thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you, Shiva. Everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks, Shiva. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Shiva. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.